With that, let's go ahead and begin. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for this informational webinar with Dr. Kent Chamberlain and I. And our hope is to be able to inform the decisions that are taking place at the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities regarding grid modernization and electric vehicle infrastructure. So my name is Cece Doucette or Cecilia, and I am the director of Massachusetts for Safe Technology, which is a citizens-based organization that helps to get information out to our local governments, our state agencies, our healthcare teams, and our schools, um, and just let people know that wireless came to market with no safety testing, and there are very serious consequences from using radio frequency radiation in our everyday environment. So with that, I'd like to outline what we'll do in the next hour. Dr. Kent Chamberlain is with us today, and he is the chair and professor emeritus from the University of New Hampshire's Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Chamberlain through the commission work that was done in New Hampshire. And as he'll go into detail, New Hampshire passed a law to investigate the health and environmental impacts of today's wireless technology. We had hoped that our federal agencies would have done that sort of an investigation and assessment years ago before rolling out wireless technology, but they have never done the scientific review of the peer reviewed literature. And so we are so very grateful that Dr. Chamberlain and the legislators in New Hampshire did finally do that assessment. They are the first in the United States in a legislative body to have taken that action. So Dr. Chamberlain will give us a presentation of their findings, and then I will rejoin us and I will give an update on some activity that's happening in Massachusetts and elsewhere. So Dr. Chamberlain, thank you so very much for joining us. And I'm not sure how these Zoom recordings work. So I think I'm going to um, first take a moment. For those of you who are joining us on the call today, if you would like to unmute and just introduce yourself momentarily, Dr. Chamberlain also appreciates knowing who he's speaking with so that he can make sure that the information he's delivering is appropriate for the audience. Helen Walker, would you like to unmute for a moment? Hi, uh, good morning. I'm a member of Massachusetts for Safe Technology and the Massachusetts Association for the Chemically Injured. And I've been working um, as an advocate for wireless safety since 2013. Great, Helen. Thank you so much. Uh, Jamie, would you like to unmute yourself? And maybe you know. <laughs> okay. Um, and he might, he or she might have stepped away. Ashley, would you like to unmute yourself? Okay. We'll move on to Greg Hunt. Greg, could you introduce yourself, please? Okay. It looks like Jamie has unmuted. Jamie, would you like to say hello? Hi, yeah, and just maybe for the um, benefit of others, um, I had to double unmute because I'm on my phone and my computer, so um, that's why I was having problems. But yep, my name is Jamie Toskis. Thank you um, for having this today. Uh, I work at the Department of Energy Resources oh, so in Massachusetts. Great, yes. Jamie. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, Greg, did you want to give it a try? Okay. Ashley, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Okay, we have somebody who has phoned in with the extension, uh, the last four digits of 6169. I believe it's star six to unmute, if you would like to give that a try. Hello, Hi. can you hear me? We can, who's joining us? I am. I am also Greg Hunt. Oh, wonderful, Greg. <laughs> my uh, internet access is uh, uh, having an issue, but my, name, my name's Greg Hunt. I'm, a, I'm actually a battery and, and solar developer, but I did a, a lot of work in uh, handling uh, EMF from uh, computers and 
EMF that gets broadcast over Ethernet cables. And uh, everything that we're doing now is wireless, and there's a lot of wireless metering and stuff going on. So, so I'm interested in uh, the information that you've collected. Oh, um, super. This is exactly the kind of collaboration we hope to develop, where we can bring folks in from industry, from the public, and from our public servants. So together, we can hopefully carve out a path that meets everybody's goals and still brings us an economic boom. So with that, Dr. Chamberlain, let me make sure that I've allowed screen sharing. Excellent. Thank you. And I think you're ready to go. Fantastic. You know, it's a small group that we have here, obviously. And my presentation is kind of designed for giving an overview to a large group of people. But considering that we have a small number of people, I invite you to, to work with me on this to get your questions answered. Uh, so having said that, let me get started with what I usually start these types of presentations with, and that is a conflict of interest statement. As Ms. Duzette pointed out, I was, when I came, was, came onto the commission, I was the chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And as such, I'm an advocate for technology. And frankly, when I heard about the commission and what they wanted to achieve, I thought this would be really easy because all of my career, I was under the impression that as long as radio wave, microwave radiation wasn't strong enough to warm you, it couldn't hurt you. So that's the, what I came in with. My, my belief. Uh, and so I'm not getting paid to do this now that I am uh, emeritus, I'm retired. I'm doing this because I feel it's my civic duty to let people know about what radiation can do, what wireless radiation can do, how it can harm you so that people can better protect themselves and so that people in industry can do a better job of designing things so that we don't get the type of exposure that, that we're now being exposed to. Um, so I'm here as a fellow citizen. I'm not, uh, I don't have a political viewpoint that I'm pushing. And the reason I am giving this type of statement right now is that if you hear from people from the cell phone industry and or from, from basically from a wireless industry, you're gonna to be told that there is no harm, no harm whatsoever associated with exposure to electromagnetic fields. And like I say, that's the, the, not the conclusion that we came to on the commission. So having said that, I'm going to start bringing up some slides and talk a little bit about the commission, not in, in great depth, but uh, bear with me a second, if you would, please, as I, I think I am able to share now. Yes, I am. So let's talk about the commission itself. Uh, this and, and because I didn't know what even how you formed a commission in the state of New Hampshire, and it's a little bit different than what I thought, because it turns out that to form a real an official commission, you need to have bipartisan support, and it has to get voted on by both houses of the the legislature. So it was signed. It was a bipartisan bill, and and by the way, I'm making these slides available. So if you want to click on any of the links when you get the slides, it'll bring you to the legislation or to the article that I'm talking about. So um, it was formed with this five page, page uh, the bill that told exactly what the, it was that the commission was supposed to do and it told who had to be on it. Uh, so this is, uh, Ms. Doucette pointed out, this is the first legislation passed in the United States calling the formation of a commission to explore the health effects, not only of 5G, but wireless in general. And, and that's what we found basically is that you can't really separate 5G from wireless in general. The, you get the same basic health effects, whether or not you're talking about uh, radiation from a baby monitor or radiation from a cell phone or from a smart meter. And I know that's pretty much the focus of today's conversation, smart meters. So the 13 members that got selected for this commission had you know, a wide range of, of expertise, including medicine and uh, you know, uh, you, you can see toxicology he had one of the world's top toxicologists, Paul Uro, who served on the commission. He came down from McGill University because he felt like the commission was so important. So we had a wide range of people with expertise and they were the ones that formed the commission. And, and I also should note that we did this on an unpaid basis. So we did this as volunteers. 
And what we did is we uh, met for a year, the commission met for a year, we did a lot of research on our own, and then we circulated papers that we thought were particularly re relevant. We brought in experts from the outside, and all of those experts, except for one, said, talked about the harms associated with wireless radiation. And of course, that one, rep the one expert brought in was the only paid expert, and he was the only one that said, yeah, there's no problem with radiation. In fact, as he left his presentation, one of his closing remarks is that he was going to stick his head in a microwave oven to demonstrate how safe it was to one of his classes. And I'm really not sure how that worked out, but I understand he's still alive. Um, the conclusions, I think you probably got a sense of what our conclusions were based upon how I prepared what I was about to say. And that is, uh, and, oh, and by the way, uh, you can you access the final report here. It's a little bit intimidating, the final report. It's uh, 390 pages, but most of that is appendix, as is true with most reports of this type. So in, the, in reading about 10 pages, you really can get a good sense of what, what it was that we did and what our findings were. But um, <laughs> here is the finding that cell phone type radiation, including 5G, poses a significant health threat, not only to human health, but also to the environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, also to say that this is not a, a scientific issue. So this is you know, a commission coming to this conclusion. It's not a scientific issue. It's a, it's a political one. Uh, peer reviewed science, and I'll be, like I say, just introducing some of it. I won't be bogging you down with it, but I will give you an overview of some of the peer reviewed literature that shows that radiation is indeed harmful. And also a conclusion that we came to is yes, technology can be used to mitigate many of the problems uh, associated with exposure. But the first thing you have to do is admit that there's any harm at all. And that's what we're not hearing from the industry. And that is admission that there's any harm at all. So I'm gonna go now through some slides fairly quickly. It uh, gives you a little bit of a technical background. And here is where I, with this, particularly with this small group, invite you, if I go too quickly through these slides, let me know, you know, put your hand up, unmute your microphone and just say, hey, can I ask a question about that? Because this is some of the background information that we as the commission had to learn to begin with. And the first one is why are we concerned about signals from wireless devices? And here's where I say there's a large and growing body of evidence showing that there is a problem associated with it. And here I call it cell phone type radiation. And, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment, because smart meters certainly come into this category. Uh, also note that other types of radiation do cause a problem, like radiation from TV stations and from radio stations. So if you live near those, you do have an increased incidence of diseases. And I can talk about what those are in just a moment. But the real concern are these is this cell phone type radiation, digital radiation, high-speed digital radiation. And the reason for that is that it's impulsive in nature. So what happens, and this is, I'm giving an example from a cell phone, you can see that it's quiet, it, the cell phone, it's not radiating. And all of a sudden it gets a call. So it has to do this handshake. So it's turning on and turning off very rapidly. And so this impulsive type radiation is far more harmful to your cells, or at least that's what I'm told from people who study this, than continuous radiation. Uh, in fact, the wording that was used was that it, it acts like a jackhammer on your cells. So uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about all devices that use all the wireless devices, such as the Bluetooth, uh, you know, cell phones, obviously, baby monitors, smart meters, cordless phones, Wi-Fi routers, and the Internet of Things. So that's what we're talking about, and that's what we looked at, and it is for that type of radiation that we, the Commission, came up with our conclusions. Other kind of questions here, uh, just, you know, what is, uh, you know, the difference between the signals from the different wireless devices? Yeah, let me get down to the bottom line here. Is it radiation from all of those devices? And I, I mentioned some of them just a moment ago, you know, blue, any Bluetooth device, smart meters, cell phones, cell towers, and cell or smart meters in the frequency range that uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, what is 900 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz in the ISM band, 
you know, it's really right there in the frequency band that we're uh, concerned about. Now, there are things like the transients from, uh, from switching power supplies and from the uh, power line communication systems, that can put a noise on top of power lines that can definitely cause problems. We as a commission did not address that. Uh, and the reason we didn't is it seemed like it was in a somewhat of a different arena. And at the time that we were discussing uh, the 5G issue, there was talk of having a commission to look at or having legislation to look at the, the uh, uh, smart meters in, in by themselves. But we didn't look that as a commission, but many of the conclusions that we came to, in fact, almost all of the conclusions we came to are directly applicable to smart meters. I wanna take uh, go to a little bit of detail and talk about power density, because that is the, there are the units that are used to describe the significance or the, the quantity, the amount, the size of the radiation. And so the first question that a lot of people want to know is how much power density do you need to have a phone call? And so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, but if you want to have great reception, uh, we're talking about something in the microwatts per square meter. Microwatts per square meter, a very small signal. And these are safe. But the, um, the limit imposed by the FCC or the threshold for radiation exposure that has set by the FCC is six watts per meter squared. So we're talking about something that is so, you know, millions of time different. In fact, you can get a very good signal, a very good signal. And yeah, that's three to four bars. I'm happy with three to four bars. And you'll get that at a billionth of the FCC limit. So you don't need a very strong signal to accomplish what you want to accomplish with the cell phone signals. And I'll talk about why the, the threshold is set so high in just a moment. But I did want to give you, first of all, the units and also let you know that the signals that you need to be to have to have good cell phone coverage is, is far, far less than what's given for the, um, or what's specified by the FCC. So what happens if you are exposed to strong wireless radiation. And the reason I'm giving this as an example is first of all, it's well documented. And I'll give you the link, it's also included here. But for a relatively small radiation exposure, you're going to get symptoms that you might not recognize. You might not associate it with your cell phone or with a cell tower. But in this case, it was pretty obvious. So this is in California where they put cell towers on or very close to fire departments where people slept. And it's pretty obvious what happened because when they turned the cell towers on, here's what happened. It's pretty obvious. And then, like I say, I put a link there. So within a week of installation, many firefighters developed unusual symptoms of headaches, fatigue, insomnia. Now, as I read through these symptoms, you might say, well, gosh, isn't that part of everyday life? And for many of us, it is. But it, it can be induced by a variety of things, as you all know. <laughs> you can drink too much the night before and you'll have a headache. But when this happens to a group of people right after a cell tower was turned on, it's pretty clear, clear what it was associated with. So that's the insidious thing about exposure is that you might not recognize the problems as being a result of exposure to radio frequency radiation. So. This is uh, what we're looking at. And by the way, if you're experiencing these symptoms as a result of exposure, there are a lot of other really bad things going on in your body, like re reactive uh, oxygen species development, which we know is uh, free radicals. So that is what happens when you turn a cell tower on. So why do the companies that I'm talking about, why do does telecom, why do many wireless uh, manufacturers, they want to keep that uh, the current radiation limits. And, and the first reason it's pretty obvious is that if people understood the concerns associated with exposure to wireless radiation, well, the, the device, they wouldn't be buying baby monitors that they're going to put next to one of their kids you definitely want to keep wireless devices away from kids because their skulls are thinner and they're much more susceptible to the to radiation issues. So clearly they don't want to recognize it for that reason. 
Um, also, the siting of telecommunication facilities, I got some examples of, of this, would be a lot more expensive. So they want to save money there. And uh, in fact, I'll just jump on and talk about something that I've been involved with in Linux Mass. And by the way, when I say I'm involved with, I'm not getting paid. Just citizens from a region say, hey, they're thinking about putting up a tower. Can you tell us about it? And so I give a presentation not dissimilar from the one I'm giving now. So here's an example of a site they wanted to, or they're still thinking about putting an antenna right here in the center of this circle, which happens to be in the center of Linux mass. Now, the reason this is desirable if you're a cell company is that you go to a place where there's already existing infrastructure. You know, power is there, the internet is already there, you can drive to it. And so the idea, and by the way, it's a great idea if radiation didn't hurt people, but you go into the center of a population density area, you know, where you want to have coverage, you put up your antenna, you turn up the power strong enough to get the desired five to perhaps even 20 mile coverage area. And that's great. The people on the outside are, you know, way out in the, out of the coverage area are going to get a good signal, but you're going to be, be exposing people near the antenna to very high levels of radiation, and they'll have the types of symptoms experienced by the firefighters in California that I just mentioned. So there's a reason that I put this 1,640 foot radius circle, it's also 500 meters, and that is that's what's been found to be a the region where you don't want to have people. So it's a setback region. In other words, you want to have towers positioned that far back from, radio, from population centers. So what would be a better alternative than what I'm showing you right here? Well, let's take a look at the, you know, the same Google image, Google Earth image. And so what you want to do is you want to go out away from the population center put up a tall mast, use a directional antenna to send the signal into this region right here, you know, into this, the region where you want to have coverage. Now, in that case, everybody's going to get a fine, strong signal, good for making phone calls and downloading data, but they're not, nobody's going to get a huge exposure to radiation. So that's just, I'm giving you some of the motivation why cell companies probably don't want to, or they want to keep the current limits. So next question is, uh, you know, which is begged right here, and that is, what is a safe distance from a cell tower? And this is relevant to, to smart meters because I'm going to be coming up with numbers that represent power densities that are found to be safe. And this is something you, clearly you'll need to know. Oops, did I don't think I went to the next slide here. Bear with me a second. So what is a safe setback distance for a cell tower? Why did we choose this distance right here? And I mentioned it in a moment ago, that is what we came at, uh, up with for a setback. And how does this relate to you know, power studies, power density as determined by animal studies? And fortunately, the two come together. And so I'm, this is where people might want to uh, hit me with questions if this is not making sense, because I want to go through it quick enough to get through all of the material. But at the same time, I don't want to gloss over anything. So to answer this very important question, how, how far is the setback that you need? How, what is a safe signal de power density level? We're going to look at a study right here, and this is something that was done in Brazil. Now, there are lots of other studies that support, that give you the same information, but this is particularly nice because it gives you a very graphical understanding of what happens when you live near to a power, uh, a, a cell tower. So this uh, was a study was done a while back. It covered the 10-year period from 96 to 2006. The very important thing from an epidemiological standpoint is it wasn't looking at one cell tower, it looked at over 800 cell towers. So the N is pretty significant in this case, the number of people. So here's what the study was all about. You have a cell tower, please forgive my drawings. And then you have people living near the cell tower. And this is all known in government databases. You know where people live, you know where the cell towers exist. 
And it turns out that for this particular study, they were looking at people who already had cancer. And what the study told, it tells, is what is the mortality for people living closer, these same people living closer to the cell tower or living farther away from the cell tower. And that's done in a single plot right here. And so this plot represents you know, the, over 800 cell towers and for lots and lots of people. And it's a very convincing plot because we have down here the mortality rate for the population in general, that's what's shown in blue right here. And these are the people in the study living a distance from the cell tower. And the, it's something that's reassuring and suggests that things are working correctly in this study is you get farther and farther and farther away from the cell tower, your mortality rate becomes the same as the population in general. Well, that's good. You, if it were something else, you would suspect that something was fishy. Also, you see a monotonic decline in the mortality rates, which is also reassuring because it suggests the dose dependence, which has been reported by many researchers. So the bottom line here is the closer you get to a cell tower, well, if you have a cancer, the more likely it is to accelerate that cancer and bring about your death sooner. Um, and it's fairly significant. And as I mentioned, I'm going to so, show a little bit more uh, studies right and coming up. But it is consistent with what people are reporting. And it does give you a suggestion, because what we're going to be doing next is say, okay, well, let's go out here. Oh, I, I haven't answered yet where the 500 meters came from. And that is that at a point where the slope of the curve seems to be changing is around 500 meters and you have to make a selection at some point you know you're never going to get perfection you can't say you have to live you know 10,000 meters from a cell tower that's not realistic we realize but, and but we didn't choose this it seems like the the uh, the research community in general came up with this value of 500 meters yeah the curve's starting to flatten out yes you have a significant reduction compared to people living really close to the cell tower so let's pick 500 meters so what we can do also in other studies, find out what the signal level is, that, that is the power density from the cell tower at a distance of 500 meters, find out what that value is, that power density, and see how that compares with what has been reported with being associated with problems with, with health effects. So we can do that here. One is the bioinitiative report, and I'm just picking a report uh, that gives some values there are lots of reports. So this isn't a, you know, a onesie, twosie type thing. No, there are lots of reports that show basically the same thing. I like this one because it, it specifies clearly what the power densities are that are associated with biological effects. That is the point at which the signal will cause harm. And so they're listing these, and what I had mentioned before, these are power density levels, and they're saying that if you're below the 0.03 to 0.5 milliwatts per meter squared, we're not seeing much of an effect. So that now gives us a value, and let's compare that with the value of signal that you would expect at 500 meters from a typical cell tower. So maybe give a pause here. I'll take a breath and see if anybody has any questions about this. Is this making sense? All right. So we have a value. I, yeah, go ahead. I do have a, one question on the previous slide. What's the exponent of the curve that you showed there? Oh, the, the exponent? Uh, you mean this is an exponential decay? Yes. Actually, I don't know. I could easily calculate that. But it does seem to be, you know, I would suspect it would be close to a one over R squared if there is a linear dose dependence, because the signal power density declines as one over R squared. So that would be my guess. That's a good question. And I can check that out. And by the way, yeah, I mean, the biological impact ought to be the cube root of that or something, you know, not actually the cube, but, you know, the, the natural exponent. So I was curious if that was close to a natural exponent, because that would be uh, you know, significant. It makes sense. And, and by the way, you can go get the report and get more information here if you want to click on that. I'm not sure how we're going to make this available. Ms. Okay. Doucette, do you have a plan? Okay, I'll be sending these to you and then you can let people know where they are. 
fantastic, thank you. Um, so here is the signal level from a typical. So what I mean by typical, it's gonna have a, a radiated power, total radiated power of about 10 watts, a gain antenna of anywhere between 12 and 16 dBi is typical. So as you move away from that tower, and this is typically done at a height of 1.5 meters, as you move away from the tower, the first thing you're going to see is an increase in signal level. And that's caused by the fact that these the uh, antennas typically are directional. So they have a beam that goes out in front of the antenna. So as you move away from the cell tower, you're gonna to be going into the main beam. You're finally gonna go out of the main beam and then you're gonna have this decrease. These are measured values for typical cell towers. And lo and behold, when you get out 500 meters, you're coming down to the signal levels reported as being the, the levels at which you don't see a significant biological effect. So I went through this very quickly. I have an entire presentation given to talking about this data, but I wanted to give you a sense is that we do have a clear understanding of not only the fact that problems exist, but also we know when those problems will start manifesting themselves, whether you're dealing with a cell tower, a cell phone, baby monitor, or a, a smart meter. So how do these uh, standards or how do these uh, value these uh, thresholds, the FCC limits compare nationally? You can see it right here that some places have very low levels, low standards. And when we're talking about the United States and Japan, a lot of uh, countries simply follow the lead of the FCC, follow the lead of the United States. It makes it easy. But a lot of countries don't. And so they choose to have much lower standards so that you uh, will not be <laughs> exposing your population to these, uh, these large values, these high values that our populations are exposed to. Uh, so you can imagine that we on a commission, you know, we're all, you know, we believe in the government because we're participating it and coming to this commission. And so the question that came up early on was why aren't our regulatory agencies doing more to protect the public? I mean, there are thousands, and this is what we came into, thousands of peer-reviewed publications documenting harm. Many other countries have higher thresholds, I just showed you. Uh, the FCC standards were in the 90s, and clearly a lot has changed since the 1990s. In particular, 1996 is when the 1996 Telecommunications Act was codified. And they were based upon the findings of radiation exposure at that time, but so much has changed that... <laughs> Our exposure is far greater today than it was when those standards were set. And we, we invited the FCC to come to our state commission. You'd think they'd come to a, a formal state commission, but they didn't. They basically gave us the runaround. They never sent anybody. We never, I don't think they even talked to anybody except secretaries. And uh, they sent us to a website. So they'd send us some email and say, go to this website. And they, we didn't get our questions answered. Things became, and I don't mean this, sound like, this to sound like a conspiracy theory, but here's what's going on. At least this is what we found out as a commission, and that is the FCC is a captured agency. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there's a lot of money behind this, a lot of reasons why some industries would very much want to keep the standards the way they are. Um, but as you can read here, industry controls the FCC through a soup to nut stranglehold. I strongly encourage you, so if, if you'd like to know more about this, please read the report. It's from Harvard, after all. And you would think that they would be very concerned about getting sued, but they came up with this report that is pretty clear that says that the FCC is not protecting us. They're acting in the behest of industry. And so that's what's going on. I don't mean to belabor this, but they show that wireless industry is using a playbook similar to the one used by big tobacco. And one of the first things you do is you get a lot of money together and you know that the cell industry can do that. They, they have a huge revenue stream. And so they have you know, $87 million in lobbying. They have over 500 lobbyists. And they're also chipping a lot of money into campaign contributions. So that's what we feel like we're dealing with in this case, that what we as a commission and our recommendations reflect that. We've got to relook at the standards for radiation exposure in order to protect people. So I think 
You can read this here, uh, but you were, if you've looked at all into how big tobacco was able to stay afloat for so long, we're seeing the same thing, you know, although actually the wireless industry is making the big tobacco look like amateurs. But I don't want to belabor that, but I do want to mention there are some good things on the horizon, actually in the rear view mirror, and that is back in February, a suit was brought against the FCC because of these clearly incorrect regulations that they have. And uh, so they were sued by the Environmental Health Trust and others. And the good part is that they won. So this is just back in August, a month ago. And so this will have ramifications for a lot of people and a lot of industries, I believe. Because if, uh, and I think this would be the fair thing, if uh, this suit prevails, and the FCC has to come up with realistic regulations that really do protect people, it's going to change the landscape of wireless technology profoundly. And there will be certainly legal ramifications. Now, I wanted to get to that point, And my next thing is to talk about what we as a commission looked at, what made us, you know, cause us to make the decisions, the, draw the conclusions we drew, but maybe now give people an opportunity. And I, I've been yakking along for over 25 minutes. Do people have comments or should I uh, can, uh, turn this over to Cece? What, what's your pleasure? Oops, I'm checking here to see. And Ms. Doucette, do you have a suggestion? Um, hi there, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Okay, great. Um, so Jamie Tosk is here. Um, Thank you for that information. Um, I, I'm just trying to follow some of the technical um, frequency analysis. And I just, is there, so it's, it's clear that there was um, a distance to the cell tower. That was pretty easy for me to understand, but is there, can you just provide a little bit more color on um, the safe levels of radiation? What are the safe levels? Sure. Yeah, good like question. Number like cumulatively, this is the number. So I'm just trying to understand like where the science is at from the commission's report perspective. Well, what we came up with, and we we find this bioinitiative report to be uh, very readable, and what they're saying right here is that if you're actually I, I actually, we, we don't know an exact value, but it's somewhere in this range is the cutoff. In other words, I can say pretty confidently that if you're below 0 0.03 milliwatts per meter squared, you're probably safe, absolutely safe. Now, you're, this is a, probably a topic that's going to be deba debated as we move forward, as we put a finer and finer edge on things. But remember, it's, it's hard to tell exactly how much exposure somebody's had. But from the laboratory studies that right now, it appears that you can expose somebody or something to this degree of radiation and you don't see a biological effect. Uh, Jamie, I'm not sure if that answered your question. No, it certainly does. Thank you. I, I think I just missed this, so thank you. Oh, it's, <laughs> there's a lot going on here. You can imagine the, the learning curve as we went through the commission and had more and more experts come in and we read more and more material. So I am prepared to, to talk about the, the information that we used. And the reason I want to do it is the people in the, that are saying that no, that uh, cell phone radiation is absolutely harmless, they attack all the articles, all the journal, peer-reviewed journal articles that say that there is a problem. So I am prepared to go through that if people are interested in seeing it. So Ms. Doucette, I see you nodding your head. I can go ahead or people can ask questions. Yeah, this, this is Greg. Um, I understand the, the, the fight that you're trying to make is to get that first admission. But I think, you know, I'm, I guess I'm curious two things. And one, it's generally energy over time you know, AMI meters used to, because it's been 20 years since that. Me too. Well, it hasn't been 20 years, but but uh, most of the trajectory of that at the time was they're not on all the time. They come on at 
uh, the ones that actually are using like wireless technology, they come on, you know, once an hour. So, so what's your total cumulative exposure if it comes on once an hour? Or do they leave them on all the time now? Like I, I you know, so I don't know where that that and that data, you know, is helpful. I think, you know, the 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 FCC is going to always be able to lean on the IEEE and then the IP people. Um, as long as they don't change their analysis, so so I'm curious if if your plan there is to really have uh, some in depth conversations of those engineering groups to have them, you know, kind of sort of support uh, what what you're saying and just come up with regulations. Maybe they maybe they, they don't need to lower uh, power, but maybe they need to make sure that it's uh, you know intermittent and not continuous or yeah, you know what I mean. Well, Are I you agree. planning on approaching those organizations? Or have so you it's yeah, you know I'm a life member of IEEE. I've been an associate editor for IEEE transactions on attendance and propagation. And right now, what we were able to tell, and we had people that were involved with IEEE in sa setting standards. They, those, the reports that we got back regarding their setting of standards, IEEE setting of standards, is they're really not open to it. They are people from industry, just like, well, of course, of course, there are people from industry. I would consider myself kind of in that boat also as a person who's doing work with industry. So you get onto those committees and they're really not set up to evaluate health effects. They don't have, they're not qualified to evaluate health effects. So I'm not sure that I would be dealing with the uh, IEEE. Although who knows, I would certainly be open to discussing things with them. Our feeling is that we probably want to go first through the FCC. That's the direct one, you know, the, the direct agency that does, that sets regulations. And so, and they then would work with IEEE. I think that this can come up with, with recommendations. These groups can come up with recommendations, but they have to get uncaptured first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I read through the, the filings and their uh, closing of their investigatory report, and I, and I read through the uh, petition and the court findings. Um, which basically just said, you know, you, you really didn't answer the question. You need to give me a real answer. Um, you know, they didn't say you're wrong. They just said, you didn't really give us a real answer. Right. Um, but it seemed like they were leaning on the fact that they're, I think the problem that they're going to have is the uh, effective use of the technology and, you know, public safety. So, I mean, I, I think everything, you know, and everything affects everything. You know, like I said, I used to do stuff with Ethernet cables. That was the big deal because the power supplies in the computer were turning the Ethernet cables into uh, antennas, you know. <laughs> uh, but people kind of got a hold of that. I guess I guess I think um, there may need to be a way to approach with a compromise that, has, you know, allows people to wait things over time. You know, it's just something to let the give the industry an out rather than geez, I now I need you know six times the number of cell towers in order to keep my uh, total exposure below this number. Maybe you know if if you approach them with something that looked more like a compromise, it might be something more palatable. I don't know. Well, I, I understand, and I, I think that the it's going to be harder on the telecom industry in particular, the longer they hold out and claim that there's absolutely no harm, because we can see that there is harm. Eventually, whatever that means, eventually they'll have to admit it, and then they may have to use a, a huge turnaround. In fact, the analogy that I'm going to use there is asbestos. I've heard cell phone radiation be described as the next asbestos. Are you familiar with it? Asbestos, the miracle molecule, strong, fireproof, a good insulator. It's wonderful for building. It's just got this really kind of bad side effect, and that is it gives you lung cancer and other horrible diseases. 
Well, industry tried to put that off for a long time. And of course, the longer they put it off, the more asbestos was installed in buildings until finally it became a huge situation for, for a lot of people with lawsuits flying around. And a lot of businesses had to close as a result of that. So I'm seeing something similar could happen with cell towers. People are going to be claiming there are going to be lawsuits. And I think that everybody on this call knows that no insurance company will insure against wireless radiation. They specifically exclude it in their policies. And so what could happen is that you could have these big companies and all of a sudden people realizing that there is an effect. The effect has been proven, it's been accepted, and the lawsuits should start flying. I think that if industry can start working preemptively to lessen the radiation and working with researchers to find out what reasonable levels are, finding out as you're suggesting, you know, can we do this maybe instead of pinging all the time with our, our smart meter, can we maybe do it on a every you know, couple of hour basis, you know, update information. I'm sure that, you know, that, that would certainly lessen the likelihood that you have this wholesale you know, lawsuit going on, uh, lawsuits going on later on. So does that make sense to you? No, it absolutely makes sense to me. I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff there to unpack in order for, I mean, you're asking people who are in charge of these agencies that aren't actually technical people to, to try to try to do something. So, uh, but yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and Jamie, I really appreciate your line of thinking. Um, I used to run the local education foundation in my town of Ashland, Massachusetts, and we kept hearing about the 21st century classroom. So as you know, good doobie parents, we jumped in and started doing fundraising because our school certainly didn't have a budget for any of this. And then lo and behold, I find out that wireless is extraordinarily harmful <clears throat> and especially to children. So. I think the message today is we all have an opportunity to start where we are and see how we can help inform those around us and then come back to the table and put our heads together and say, this is a really disastrous problem. What can you and I do to move that needle towards safe technology? We hope the FCC will do the right thing. History with captured agencies, or as one of the scientists said, I've worked with lab rats my whole life and you corner a rat and they'll fight till the death. So it would be foolish of us to wait for higher ups to tell us what to do when we have opportunities today to start making those changes. And in my home, for example, my husband really wanted to take advantage of the um, rebates that were being given to the solar installations. And so I met with five different solar companies to ask them about the radio frequency radiation transmissions. And we made sure that there were none coming off of our solar panels or our inverters. Um, and I've done some remediation around the smart meters that came with that. Um, and I'm still at risk for the dirty electricity that's coming into my home or harmonics or whatever's coming in. So we all need to work together and get to these solutions. Um, Dr. Chamberlain, was there more in your presentation you wanted to continue well, with? If people are interested in seeing what the materials were, the journal articles, I have just a little, probably five, 10 minutes that I can finish up with that. Okay. And it just depending on what people want. Does this sound like something you'd like to see? Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm not sure if I'm yes. on. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I'm actually going to need to leave at about 12. So I just want to, I'm willing to listen to, you know, um, anything else you would like to present. Uh, but I just want to let you know that I'll need to, to wrap up around 12. I appreciate you letting us know. So I may be able to do this in 10 minutes. So let me go here and just note that these are the peer republic, uh, publications that we use. Uh, these are, and we, we, we looked at hundreds of them, if not thousands, collectively. And so my role on that was as an academic, as I would look at uh, these publications and determine if they were fringe publications, because that is what the telecom industry says, is that, eh, they're inconsistent, they're done, they're fringe publications, and you know, they, they're cherry picking. So I'd like to address those issues because if you hear from people from telecom, that's what they're going to say. And I, I because of I was being a department chair, being an academic, 
Uh, and just being that IEEE associate editor, I, I was able to look at and uh, determine the quality of, of journals. You look at the review panels, you look at the editorial board, you look at the acceptance rate. There are a lot of things you can look at with the journal. And I can tell you that the journal articles I'm just going to go through very rapidly were all from uh, quality journals. There's nothing fringe about them. Uh, just uh, here's, and like I said, I'm going to do this quickly, but if as you look at the slides, if you want to find out more, just click on the link and it'll bring you to the article. This one right here talks about oxidative stress at typical uh, cell phone levels that you might be exposed to. And you're going to be hearing about this uh, a fair amount oxidative stress, uh, free radicals. Here's another one that looks at uh, for oh, damage to the human ear canal hair, hair follicles. Uh, DNA damage, that's not something you want to hear. Uh, the other one, uh, fibroblasts, skin fibroblasts. Uh, so if you're exposed to microwave radiation, it affects the ability of your, your skin to reproduce because that's what those fibroblasts do. Wanted to spend just a little bit more time on this one right here. This talks about some of the psychological effects that can occur. And if you look at these symptoms, they will look familiar. So in other words, this has been replicated in the laboratory, the symptoms from exposure, the psychological symptoms. And so if you want to know more, look at the article. Uh, this one right here from oh, sperm count, you take uh, sperm you know, and put it into two beakers. You expose one to cell phone radiation at the levels that you're being exposed, probably right now, if you have your cell phone near you, compared to a control group. And you're going to see a significant decline in motility and morphology and all that other good stuff. So we know that sp sperm count is declining in this country. This is certainly a contributing factor. Uh, type 2 diabetes, they had students in two high schools. One had five, one high school had five times the exposure because they had a nearby cell tower than the other high school. They found a significant, statistically significant difference in, uh, in blood sugar, essentially, meaning that the kids with a greater exposure were more likely to get type 2 diabetes. You know, <laughs> we know that we're having an epidemic of, of diabetes right now. Something that you may not have known is that exposure to cell phone radiation has an impact on trees. If you put in a cell tower, the trees near the cell tower will start showing degradation on the uh, tower facing side first, and it'll go around the entire tree. So even in, uh, vegetation and trees are affected as are insects. So again, read these articles if you want to follow up on them. So we know that uh, near, that we, we the insecticides will have a negative effect on bees and pollinators and the like, but it turns out that so will cell phone radiation exposure. And when you combine the two, you have a devastating effect on insect populations. Now, here's a, well, just the slide, my last slide, and that is, are we cherry picking? Do all of the published studies show harm? And the answer is no. And this follows the, the progression of reporting on this problem follows the trajectory of smoking. You know, five out of six people who smoke don't get lung cancer. Well, that's a contradiction. So have we proven that this, uh, smoking causes lung cancer? No. And for every heavy duty smoker that dies at a ripe old age, that's contradictory data. And so what happens is usually early on when you start reporting on a malady like this, it's, it's conflicted. And sure enough, if you look back and, and look at the, uh, this goes back and you can click on the article. Back in 2010, only 28% of industry funded studies showed harm from cell phone radiation. But that's, uh, if you look at the non-industry funded studies, 66% of them showed harm. And that's why I'm saying right here is that it depends on who's funding the study. However, as with smoking, over time, the real picture begins to emerge and come into focus. So if you look at the same type of analysis done 10 years later, you'll find that the reporting of neurological studies associated with radiation exposure, and this is all studies, 73% of them show a problem. When you look at genetic effects, 65% of all studies. And here's the one that I've mentioned is being really important, oxidative damage, really a major problem. 91% of all studies show that there is a problem, a cause and effect with radiation exposure. So are we cherry picking? 
I'll let you decide. And you can go back and look at the articles. And more articles are continuing to come out, and they are showing harm. So our conclusion is that, yes, we're dealing with something that causes harm. We hope that industry will do the right thing and start exploring this and exploring solutions more effectively as we move into the future. And that really concludes the parts that, uh, that I wanted to say here. I'll turn it over to you to Ms. Doucette. Uh, oh, we can't hear you. You are <laughs> muted. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamberlain. We really appreciate you putting that information together in a way that most of us can understand most of it. Um, we know sometimes it's like drinking water out of a fire hose when we st first get tipped off that there's something really wrong here with wireless radiation. So, But there are incredible resources available. And I've got just a brief slide presentation, too, that I would like to share um, to talk about resources, because now that we've identified the problem, let's see, we see what we can do. Can everybody see that uh, sure slide? Can. Okay, thanks, yeah. Ken. So... I, like I said, had no idea we were up against something with wireless. I hold a master's in technical and professional writing. So part of what I do is to look at, you know, research. So it, it blew my mind when I first started looking at this, but we ultimately became the first in the United States to even have this little sign over here to start protecting our kids. They unfortunately are still waiting for higher authorities to tell them what to do, but at least we have some precautionary measures. So for higher authorities, I work with Senate President Karen Spilka, who's my senator, and she and I, had we worked together on a lot of these campaigns to bring this toxic technology into our schools. She put me together with a lawyer in her office, and we crafted out a bill to form a commission. And in Massachusetts, we kind of moved like molasses. But thank goodness when we had the same conversation with Representative Patrick Abrami in New Hampshire, who, by the way, is also an engineer, he did the deep dive into the science and had this major wow moment. And that's how that commission got formed on which Dr. Chamberlain was asked to serve. On this crazy journey, I've had the privilege of connecting with many of the world's leading scientists and doctors. So we can easily connect you directly to the experts to answer your technical questions. And I have helped to form a nonprofit out of Europe called Wireless Education where we've distilled this massive issue into courses that can be completed online in about a half an hour. We've got one for schools and families, and we've got one for the corporate workplace. So we literally have off the shelf training ready to go. I thought I was the only one figuring this out when I first fell down the rabbit hole about eight or nine years ago. And then um, through the legislative work, we discovered there are people in towns all over the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who have figured out this is what's making them sick or their loved ones or they've lost loved ones from the glioblastoma brain tumors or the acoustic neuromas or the thyroid cancers. And so last year we formalized Massachusetts for Safe Technology is a place where people can go for information and I can be brought in to give talks uh, like this today. I show to you this Health and Buildings Roundtable Conference down at the National Institutes of Health. I was asked to co-chair the technology panel, and I was very fortunate to bring with me uh, Frank Clegg, who's the retired president of Microsoft Canada, and he's now speaking out about this issue. We also brought Dr. Martin Paul, who is one of the world's leading scientists on this, Theodora Scarato, who's the executive director of the Environmental Health Trust, who just won that lawsuit against the FCC. Um, and I like to show these links here because our talks are all under 10 minutes, so it won't be overwhelming, but it's a great resource to open this conversation with your colleagues and your loved ones. One of the gaps we had when I fell down the rabbit hole is we had so many people getting sick and getting misdiagnosed because our medical teams had not been trained to recognize microwave sicknesses. So we're very pleased that world leading experts gathered with us in January and Libby Kelly went through all of the protocols to get this certified as continuing medical education credits for both doctors and nurses and our first responders. So we're plugging a lot of the gaps that we had just five years ago because we now have the credible education to help move this forward. So one of the 
ways to help people understand this issue is to just simply show them the fine print that's been in their devices all along. If by chance you have an iPhone with you today, you just go into settings, scroll down and hit general. On an old phone, you hit about at the top. Most people have upgraded. So from general, just go down to legal and regulatory. And you find right there this RF exposure for radio frequency radiation that's been in there all along. And they tell you to keep this away from your body, that it was tested at as a, as a distance from the body. And they tell you to use a hands-free option because otherwise you're being radiated by five or, five or six separate antennas or more now if you've upgraded to 5G. And nobody understands that. They just get these devices, use them the way they're being promoted, and they're radiating themselves day and night. So one of the benefits um, of learning this is you can recognize that this is an invisible toxin, but we have tools to make this invisible toxin visible. And so I became the first in the United States to put a radio frequency detection meter on loan in my public library. So residents can just take it out, go home, gather the data, do your gap analysis and see how you might wanna fix this. So I'll just take a moment to give a little bit of a demonstration here. So in my home, because of what I've learned, we made the transition over to safe, hardwired technology. And that just simply means running everything back through ethernet cables. You can get little adapters for a cell phone or a tablet, short money, 20, 30 bucks if that. Um, and so in my home, when I turn this on, you'll see that it's down in the green and flashing. That's the lowest level that this you know, $400 device will do. And when I turn my cell phone on, I'm taking, I keep it in airplane mode as a rule and people know to get me on my landline or just shoot me an email. This is what's happening. It's talking off the charts, right? This is just one device. The cell um, towers and other, you know, let me turn this back off. So it dissipates and then it drops completely off. Now you and I have a choice about our personal devices, but when we start putting smart meters on our homes without informed consent, I have a little three minute video that I did for the Department of Public Utilities hearing last week. And I just sat down next to the wall where we've got our two electric meters mounted and we did the calculations and it pulses 17,000 times in a day. 17,000 of these hits like Dr. Chamberlain said, jackhammers, short, but it's that spiked erratic pulse that is what's doing the biological harm. So a doctor and I went after a grant and put one in the Newton Free Library that anybody in the state can take out with their Minuteman library card. And out in Pittsfield, anybody who's part of their library network can take out the Safe and Sound Pro Meter. This is the one that was recommended at the medical conference for people to, um, loan out in their medical practices. And my cable station came in and did a 23 minute public service announcement of a walkthrough of my home and I show typical exposures and suggest ways to remediate. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. taught us that when we actually make important changes in society, it comes through three channels. The public engages, which is the conversation we're hoping to stimulate today the courts rule, and we can already see that happening at the federal level, and then public policy is enacted, and thank goodness New Hampshire is leading the nation with that state level policy. But other states, other countries are already taking actions on this, but we don't hear about it through the captured mainstream media. And then at the local level, Boston has already filed comments with the FCC, they joined others across the nation to sue the FCC over local control. So it goes on and on, but we just don't hear about it. Once we know, that gives us the confidence to carry this conversation forward. And as we said, there are many lawsuits that are taking place or have already been won to get this right through the courts, through our federal agencies and down into our communities. So 
many, many lawsuits that we can discuss. Massachusetts also has legislation that we've had for a number of years. One would address smart meters, one would form a commission, and another would address radiating our children in schools. Um, and there are several others out there as well. Just some notes. When we were testifying before the Department of Public Utilities last December, that very day, the largest water district in the United States announced that they were halting their AMI smart meter rollout because they had been brought the technical and the health information on what these are doing. So they did, they just put a stop to it. It can be done. Right now, there's a Supreme Court case at the state level in Pennsylvania. Uh, we signed on to an amicus brief that will become available in the coming days. Vermont already offers a no fee opt out so that in the short term, people who are sick or don't want to get sick from these smart meters can be retrofitted with an analog mechanical meter that will not introduce dirty electricity onto the power lines, nor will it pulse this radio frequency radiation. Uh, NMAX is one utility company that already has, you know, this wonderful protocol set up where customers can just simply send in their readings. So it doesn't have to be a fee-based opt-out. There's no reason for that. Analog meters are readily available. Far too many customers are being told by the energy companies, oh, it's not available anymore. Well, I called up one of the manufacturers and they said, of course we can make whatever the customer wants. So we need to be very careful about disinformation coming in from industry. And this is a huge environmental justice issue as well. They used this uh, town of Worcester in Massachusetts, which is an environmental justice community. That's where National Grid rolled out their smart grid pilot program, which was um, flagged for fraud based on the finances alone, but they put all these toxic meters on people's homes without any kind of informed consent. There's an excellent TED talk by a Silicon Valley engineer. His wife is a medical doctor. And when a bank of smart meters went in, both Jeremy and his wife became very ill. So he's got a great TED talk there. <clears throat> so let's look at solutions. It's not rocket science. Dr. Chamberlain will tell you, it's not hard to create safe technology. First, investigate. Here's some resources you can drill down into for municipal leaders. It's critical that we differentiate the public's priorities from the industry's priority, which is always gonna have finance as the bottom line, but we've got to find the balance between the economy and public health. Reinventing Wires is out of a policy group in Washington, DC, and they identify for us more than a dozen reasons why investing further in any wireless infrastructure is a really bad idea from fire hazards to safety to privacy and through the health and on and on. Um, and future-proofing, wireless is not future-proof. Hardwired to the premises via fiber optics, high-speed cable or copper is the proper direction to go in. So that's what our, our municipalities and our state should be investing the money into. We know money is flowing now because of COVID to get technology accessible to everybody, that's where the investment should be, be headed. Our companies who are building this infrastructure should be ensuring that we can connect directly to the internet through cabling and not emitting wireless emissions. And again, always measure, but don't measure against FCC guidelines because they are falling apart right now. Measure against biological effects. And we already have a principle from the Centers for Disease Control called ALARA, or as low as reasonably achievable. They have that in place for ionizing radiation. This is where we need to get to for non-ionizing radiation. Let's get to as low as reasonably achievable and educate the public so where we are today, they can make safe technology choices. And for those who kind of want to know what safety looks like for their own loved ones and themselves, it's not hard to do. On the back of your router, you'll have plugs for an ethernet cable. Get a shielded cable. That just means there's a foil liner that prevents the electric and magnetic fields from bleeding out into your living environment. If you have more than one device, which most people today too, just get this little extension 
which is called an ethernet switch and you can plug in a bunch of different devices. This one has five plugs. In a school, you could get one with 28 plugs, whatever you need, it's there. And then just buy shorter cables to go directly to your devices, hook them up to adapters if you don't have an ethernet jack in your device anymore. And then once you do go in and turn off all the radio frequency antennas, you can forward cell phone signals right to your landline so that when you're not on the go, there's no reason you should have radiation around you. The best news is, is that when you decide to hardwire, you get a much faster signal. Your signal is far more reliable and your security and your privacy are much better accounted for. So lots of reasons to just take another look at how we're individually using our technology and then start making your choices. So thank you for letting us share these presentations with you today. You can find more at Massachusetts for Safe Technology. Feel free to reach out directly and I can connect you with other experts in the field and to Dr. Chamberlain. And if you just wanna get the bottom line, please, for less than the cost of a movie ticket, go take the schools and families course at our little nonprofit. That fee just helps to keep us afloat. And then we've got a corporate course. We can literally train the workforce on your lunch hour for about $25. So that's unheard of for corporate training, but we're not here to get rich. We just want the public to know and to start producing safe technology. So thank you everybody for your time. Um, is there any question coming from anybody who's been with us today? Okay, thank you everybody. We will make this available and we will include Dr. Chamberlain's slides and my slides in the description on YouTube when we post this. Thanks so much and have a tech safe day. Great.